I'm going to resume live sharing. All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar, Preparing for WCAG 2.2 a look at the new accessibility checks. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, this webinar is hosted by Moncito, powered by Civic Plus. Um, we offer a platform that scans your website and helps you identify different issues and errors, everything from broken links and misspellings to performance errors. And of course, why we're all here today and a very important topic that I know uh, my colleagues are very excited to share and talk with you about, it is website accessibility, of course. Before we kick it off today, I did just want to go through a few quick housekeeping rules. So Zoom does have um, live transcription or live captioning enabled. Uh, so please do feel free to make use of that if you would like. In addition, um, the recording uh, that we will provide afterwards will have closed captions as well. Please do just give us a few days to process those. Um, we will send out the recordings and the slides after the session. It does just take a, a few days for us to process it, as I said, so do keep a lookout for it in your inbox um, at the start of next week. We encourage questions of all kinds um, during the webinar. Please do put them in the questions panel rather than the, the chat so I can keep an eye on them. We will address all of the questions at the end of the session. I know some of you have been great and proactive and also pre-submitted some questions. So we'll try to get through as many of those as possible as well. If we don't get to any of your questions that you've sent in, either beforehand or live here, um, we will do a follow-up Q&A as well and send that out um, along with the follow-up. So do stay tuned for all of that. With that, I just wanna do some quick introductions of today's speakers. So my name is Jasmine de Guzman. I am the Director of International Marketing here at Civic Plus, of course, uh, representing the Moncito brand as well, or the Moncito product as well. And uh, I, if you've joined any of our webinars before, you know that is definitely what I like to do is help making sure that all of you are getting access to lots of fantastic and great information about how you can optimize and improve your website on a daily basis. And I've got two of my colleagues with me here today, and I'm going to let Lars introduce himself first. Yeah, hello everyone, uh, and thank you for showing up. My name is uh, Lars, and I've been here in Monsito for about one and a half months uh, today, so <laughs> I'm still quite new here. Before that, I spent like uh, most mostly 10 years in my own uh, consultancy doing a lot of accessibility testing and a lot of uh, accessibility consultancy. Uh, consulting and, and now here in uh, Mancito, I'm mainly uh, working with improving uh, our actual, actually um, the actual accessibility tool that we have here. Awesome! Thanks so much, so much, Lars, and we are so happy and thankful to have you here on as our digital accessibility expert with us today. And we've also got Sydney here, who I'll let also introduce herself. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Sydney. I'm an associate product manager uh, with Moncito. I've been here now for about four months, so I'm also fairly new. Before this, I actually worked in uh, public policy research. So it's been actually really exciting to sink my teeth into accessibility policy as I've been working here. So excited for my first webinar as well. Wonderful. And we're super happy to have you both with us uh, live today. So what are we going to be talking about, or more specifically, what are Lars and Sydney going to be talking about? Well, um, WCG 2.2 is coming up. So Lars is gonna jump into a little bit about why it's so important to be paying attention to this updated version of these accessibility guidelines. Um, Sydney is then going to jump in a little bit about the difference between 2.0, 2.1, and 2.2, helping you to really understand um, what is the difference between them? After that, Lars is actually going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the specific accessibility checks. And Sydney will round us off with how you can tackle website accessibility compliance before we jump into the Q&A. And if you joined us before, or if it's your first time, we always love to do a little quick poll or a quick little pulse check at the beginning of our webinars. And so today's pulse check is, what level of WCAG are you trying to comply with today? So I'm just going to launch the poll. And the options are WCAG 2.0, 2.1, 2.2. Or if you're trying to comply with something else or you're just not sure, feel free to drop it in the chat. Always curious to know how you guys are tackling it out there. 
Um, so I can see there is quite a few people who are, the answers are trickling in. I'm just gonna give it a couple more seconds. You can see about 65% of you have voted so far. 67%. All right, I am going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. So it seems about 26% of you are currently aiming to comply with WCAG 2.0. Um, I completely, completely understand that. That is the um, level that the Americans with Disabilities Act currently references. 56% of you, so over half are working right now to comply with WCAG 2.1. And 17% of you are already very proactive and, and aiming to uh, comply with 2.2. And then there's 1% of you who've dropped some uh, details in the chat. So we'll make sure to take a look at that in a little bit. So I'm just gonna close this out and jump in. And I'm actually going to hand it off to Lars now, who is going to jump a little bit into why you should pay attention to WCAG 2.2. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine. So yeah, um, I just want to say a little bit about uh, why is it actually important, why is WCAG important, why is this new version? important and if you jump us to the next slide Jasmine. Um, so really the, the we hack or the web content access related guidelines they are set up it's it's an it's a national standard and it's uh, like a set of rules or success criteria as we say that you can that you can follow to make sure that your web content and digital content is uh, accessible to most um, as many people as possible. And really often I think a, a misconception is often that people think that accessibility is only about blind people or visually impaired people. Um, but really talking about the weak act standard as we call it, it's um, it's much broader than such. It, it, the standard is really built to, to try to, to include as many disabilities as possible. And really also an important point here I think is that even though the standard is here to make sure that people with disabilities can actually use your websites, your mobile applications, etc. Um, then these things that we do that are, that are must-haves for some people with some disabilities, like someone like myself who's blind and who can't see anything, there are certain things that is just a must-have for me. But many of these things that we that we do to 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 help people with disabilities actually helps much um, broader. There are different research uh, projects um, indicating that 30, 30 up to 40% of the population actually benefits from uh, following these uh, accessibility criteria. And, and as we um, get a, a bit more into what, what the criteria actually are, it may be a little bit more clear why, why it's not only good for people with um, disabilities, but, but why uh, actually it will benefit a lot of other people. Uh, yeah, will you check the next slide, Jasmine? All right. So we are on the main principles now. I, I hope we are. I can see the slides that Jasmine is sharing. I have my own version here, so I hope we are on the same page now. But um, really, in, uh, in WCAG, uh, we have these three layers of guidance, you can say. So at the top layer, uh, if, if you look, look at uh, Top down at the top, you have like these four principles, um, which are perceivable and uh, operable and uh, understandable and robust. So it's kind of a, some some top level principles you can follow. And under under these ones, you have some guidelines. Uh, it's more like fine grained categories for accessibility. And under uh, and under these guidelines, we have the success criteria. So the success criteria that's kind of the the, the bottom layer. Of the standard, and that's really where it becomes fun, I think, because that's where we have all the rules. So when you need to figure out, do you actually uh, conform to the to the accessibility standard? It, it would be the success criteria you would be looking into. These are the these ones where we where we are supposed to be able to say yes or no. Do we actually follow this uh, success criteria or not? 
And also, if you do any, if, if you use any kind of uh, accessibility testing tool like uh, the one we provide here in Monsito, all the checks that we do in, in accessibility testing tools, they always refer back to these success criteria. So they are uh, yeah, kind of very uh, essential to, to understand what, what to do actually in your website. And will you take the next uh, slides, Jasmine? So why is it important now that we have this new uh, version or release coming up, the, the 2.2 of Recap? Um, really, when, when Recap first came out, the, the version 2 came out, that was back in uh, 2008. So that's quite some years ago now. Um, then, then got like an updated version 2.1 in 2018, and then now we have this uh, version 2.2 coming up now. But first, when it came out in, in, in uh, 2008, really we didn't have that many mobile phones. Uh, we didn't do that much web surfing on on, uh, on smartphones. Um, so a lot of things came after that when people started to to use the smartphones for, for web applications and just for, for reading websites. Uh, so, so we were missing something there in the original version two, and also there were some groups, some some groups of people which we. It was really hard at that time to to actually set up good rules. Uh, I think especially people with cognitive disabilities at that time we didn't know much about how to actually make some proper rules for how to help these people, and also because it's like people with cognitive disabilities. That's really um. A, a diverse, a really diverse group of people. It's, it's, there's a lot of things um, going on and it can be a lot of different issues uh, these people have. So, so we didn't have proper uh, support for that in the original version two. So, so in the 2.1, uh, some things were added to make it better. Uh, still wasn't good enough. Uh, so now people worked on and <laughs> did some more research and now, uh, and, a bit more things are added in this next uh, 2.2 version so basically to to make the standard better also for, for these groups of people so that i think that's enough for me for now so i will hand it over to sydney for a little while yeah thanks lars um so now i'm going to talk about a couple of the important things to know about the different wcag versions that lars just walked you through jason Thanks. So, you know, when a new version of WCAG is released, it always builds on or adds to the previous version. So, you know, going off what Lars was just speaking about, WCAG 2.0 that was released in 2008 has 38 original success criteria. So then when 2.1 was released in 2018, the W3C added 12 new criteria to that, to those existing 38, to get us to the 50 success criteria in today in 2.1. So now with the most recent draft of 2.2, covering a lot of those topics that Lars just walked you through, the W3C have added nine more criteria to those 50. So that means that 2.2 is expected to contain 59 success criteria when it's released early next year. You know, that's still a draft, so obviously that number could maybe change a little bit, but it'll be right around 59 or somewhere right there. Jasmine, next slide. So the good news is, is, you know, given that these versions build on each other in this way, all WCAG versions are backwards compatible. So meaning if you comply with 2.2, you automatically comply with 2.1 and 2.0. You know, the converse of that is not true, obviously. So if you comply with 2.1, you still have those nine additional criteria to meet 2.2. That said, you know, we do expect that legislation that references 2.0 or 2.1 will eventually be updated to refer to 2.2. So, you know, that's something to keep an eye on and watch for. Um, another thing I did want to mention, this spring, the Department of Justice issued new guidance on web accessibility. And that guidance specifically references and links to the WCAG standards and mentions them as a good way to ensure accessibility of website features. So that was just a really big nod and affirmation of WCAG by the GEO Day that came out recently that I just wanted to highlight for folks, um, just given that it seems like accessibility is not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. 
for websites. Uh, Jasmine, next slide, please. So now we're going to go and talk to Lars a little bit again to walk you through specifically some of the new WCAG 2.2 checks. Yeah. So um, I just try to walk you through these uh, new success criteria. And as Sibby just said, there are nine new criteria. I'll only show you seven slides today. That's that's really because two of the new criteria, they really they, they come in two versions, like a minimum version and a more enhanced version. Uh, but they are kind of the same concept. So I, I just collapsed it into uh, into one slide for, for each of these two. So, so you'll have these seven slides now uh, for the new criteria. And um, also I want to say, I'm just giving you kind of the overview. My intention is just that you understand what are these new success criteria about. I must say there are many more details when you dive into them. Some of them have, yeah, have there are more details, but there are also some exceptions to some of them. And we don't go into all of these details uh, today. It, it would take much more time than what we can do now. So um, I just hope to give you the overview of, of what's, what's in these new things. So um, yeah, Jasmine, next one, please. So the first one we have is the accessible authentication. And that's about, um, when you have your user uh, authenticating uh, herself or himself in your website, logging in, for example, you don't want to force, or you should not force your user to do some kind of cognitive test uh, just just to log in on your site. So what is a cognitive test? That, that could be a lot of different things. It could be something like and uh, asking your user to solve a math equation to prove it's actually a human. Um, that could be one thing, but it could also just be forcing the user to to actually type her password into the password field. Imagine you are a person with some short-term memory issues. Um, in that case, you would ra rather than remembering your password, you would probably keep your uh, passwords in the password manager or just a text document, and you would copy paste uh, in, into the password field. Then, if the website uh, if the input field kind of blocks for pasting, if it only allows people to type into it, then the, then the user could, could not really paste her password in here and, and it would really force the user to, to, to be able to remember while typing. That would also be an example of uh, failing uh, this one. Yeah. And will you go on to the next one, um, Jasmine? which is the consistent help. And uh, what we have here is when you have some kind of help functionality, that could be a help chat function like we have it on the Monsito website. It, it could just be uh, personal contact information where, where you reach out to a person for, for help. That, that help information, when, when that exists across all of your pages, often you, you don't only have your help um, section on your front page, you have it on, on all your pages, really your user should be able to find it in the same spot. So for example, if your help is at the right bottom of your page on the one page, you want it to be at the right uh, bottom of, of your page on all your pages. So, so the user uh, knows where to look for it. And then the next one, Jasmine. So, the next one is the bragging uh, movements. And um, what, what that means is you, you, you want your user to be able to, or whenever you have some kind of input element that requires bragging, and I'll explain what that means. You, you also want your user to be able to just use a single point, pointer without bragging. And it really means if you have something like a slider, to drag, that would mean to, to drag the slider. That would be, for example, if you have to move the, you have this scale from zero to 100%, and right now it's uh, pointing at 50%, you want to turn it up to 100%. One way of doing this would be dragging. So where you take your mouse pointer, point it at the 50% marker, press down on the button while you hold down your mouse button, you move up to the 100% and release the button. 
so many pe people, it would simply not be possible if you have some um, uh, motor impairments, for example, to to do that combination of uh, pointing, holding, uh, moving mouse while holding down and releasing at the right spot. So another version would just be that you could just point your uh, mouse pointer at 100% and just click and it would just jump up there. So that would be the good version that would um, uh, fulfill this uh, criteria. And will you take the next one, Jasmine? So that's the focus appearance. And the focus appearance, now we need to talk a little bit about uh, keyboard navigation because many users, they cannot use the computer mouse and they would need to use uh, the keyboard or similar, uh, some, some similar inputs to the keyboard. But imagine you, you, you navigate by tapping and right, you use your tap key to jump uh, between the links and the buttons and all these things you can interact with on your website. When you're tapping around with the keyboard, you have this focus indicator, which actually shows, it's usually it's like a rectangular shape around the, the link or the button that is in focus right now. Uh, and obviously you need to be able to see what's, what's actually in focus by the keyboard right now. And earlier on, we also had a requirement in, in the earlier versions of of WCAG, let's say, there must be visual focus uh, for the keyboard. Uh, the problem was just that it didn't say anything about how visual it should be, you know, how easy it should be to see that. So in reality, that meant it could be very, very difficult to uh, to actually see where where you were located with, with your keyboard. Imagine you had like a, the focus indicator could be just one pixel wide, one pixel by one pixel, and it could be a dark brown on a black background. Technically, you could still see it, but in reality, it was very, very hard to see it. So, so now what we have now, uh, that, that, that became a little bit better. There were some more requirements when, when 2.1 came out. And now in 2.2, it's getting much more clear on how uh, that was something about um, how good contrast your focus indicator needs and also uh, the size of the focus uh, indicator. And there are some more details uh, depending on the shape of, of your focused element and, and all these things. So I won't go into these ones, but basically it's, it's, you have, we, have, we have some measures now for how visible the keyboard focus should be. And that's, that's really good, I think. Will you take the next one, Jasmine? Thank you. And that is the focus, not obscured. So what does that mean? We're still in the uh, we're still talking about the, the the keyboard focus here. Again, imagine you are uh, you navigate your website by tapping around with your, your keyboard, jumping from link to link. Then, if you have some kind of content like an overlay window or something popping up popping up on your website. Uh, perhaps you can imagine how you can have your keyboard focus disappearing behind what's the, this overlay that, that is popping up on your side. And you don't want that to happen because then, of course, you don't, you, you just don't know where you are with your, with your keyboard uh, focus if that kind of is hiding behind some other contents on your website. And the next one, Jasmine. My keyboard. So the next one is the redundant entry. And what does that mean? Yeah, so in some instances, that's, that's particularly when, when we are filling out forms um, in, in we, when we have some kind of workflow where we have multiple steps in form, sometimes we see that the user has to fill out the same information again and again. So for example, if you are ordering something in a web shop somewhere, first you enter your name and your address and all that stuff. And then sometimes you are asked to enter uh, the same information again for your billing address. And for some people, for example, with some cognitive disabilities or for some people with some uh, motor impairments, it can be really difficult actually to type in these information. So, so for these people, it's really, really a good help to not to be forced to, to enter the same information again when it's not uh, necessary. So, so they really depend on that. But I think this, this is one of these ones where, where it's quite clear also, it's just convenience for, for anyone that, that we don't have to, to re-enter the uh, things we already uh, entered previously. 
Will you jump to the next one, Jasmine? Thank you. So the next one I have here is the target stars. And um, that's that's the last one we have here. And um, again, it's one of these ones I think just intuitively would make sense to, 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 to most people. It really, it's really just about now we have a minimum um, target size for, for the interactive elements like the buttons and the links if they are too small. So, so now, now the criteria says they have to be anything you, you have to click on or touch on on your touch screen or, or whatever it is. It has to be, it has to be at a minimum 24 by 24 pixels. Um, and, and I think that's, that, that should be quite in, in, in intuitively <laughs> obvious why it's just easier for everyone to hit with a mouse or to, um, if, if you are working on your mobile phone and uh, phone and uh, trying to hit very small targets with the thumb, can just be difficult. So now we just have a minimum uh, size for for the hit uh, target area on these elements. So that was a fast uh, run through these new criteria. Yeah, as I said, there were or there are more details to the to, to all of them, uh, and, and some of them have some uh, exceptions. But but I hope at least it, it gives you some kind of idea about what what is the new stuff um, in there. And then I want to hand it over to Sydney again. Yeah, thanks, Lars. So. Now I'm going to walk through some recommendations to help you tackle or start tackling website accessibility compliance goals or how you can start working towards 2.2. Jasmine, next slide, please. Thanks. So the first thing we always recommend, do an audit of your website. Figure out where your website currently stands. You know, as a part of that audit, you're going to want to identify what legislations and what CAG standards apply specifically to your organization or to your region. You know, once you have a good understanding of that, you know, consider whether you want to work towards a higher standard or a higher level than your minimum requirements. You know, again, the versions are always backwards compatible, and doing that can future proof you some. You know, so currently, like we said earlier, 2.2 is still in draft stage, so legislation obviously isn't going to refer to 2.2 yet. But again, we always recommend folks work to comply with the most recent set of guidelines. You know, you'll still be in compliance with the earlier versions, and then when that legislation is updated to reflect 2.2, you're already in compliance or working towards it, and you're not going to be scrambling to meet any unknown timeframes or deadlines to come up to compliance. Um, then, you know, once you do know what guidelines you want to work towards, figure out what accessibility issues you currently have. Where are you compliant? Where could you really do with some improvement? And where is your website really failing to meet those standards? You know, this will let you know and give you a good idea of what you're working with and having that understanding of where your website's issues actually are. You know, that's going to help you decide and prioritize where you want to start making your improvements. Jasmine, if you can go to the next one, please. So, you know, that said, the next thing that we really recommend people do when they're working with website accessibility is to prioritize. Um, working with web accessibility, especially when you're just getting started or working towards a new standard, it's gonna be, it can be at least like really daunting or overwhelming. There's always a lot of information to sort through and you're not gonna be able to fix it all at once. You're just not. So the best thing you can do is to prioritize and then just start and just start working down that list. A couple of prioritization strategies I want to mention, you know, one is start with your most popular content, your most visited pages, your most used documents. If you know that you have one section or function or document on your site that sees a lot of traffic, start with that because that's going to have an impact on most users. You know, second, go after global elements, you know, things that affect all or most of your site. And then, you know, another is go after all of the low hanging fruit, you know, fix and go through and find those simplest tasks, the ones that are going to be easy, the ones that are going to be quick, 
get those out of the way so that you're not having to think about them, at least for the time being, and then work up towards the things that may require more planning and development work. Jasmine, next slide, please. So, you know, another thing I wanted to mention, when you're working through this, another great thing to do is to identify an accessibility champion within your team or within your organization. You know, that would be an internal person who is responsible for and dedicated to overseeing your team's accessibility compliance. You know, ideally, this person would make sure to keep an eye on and stay up to date with accessibility legislation that affects your industry or your jurisdiction. Um, and then also be responsible for identifying and prioritizing, you know, where and when changes do need to be made to keep up with that legislation or your goals. <laughs> um, they would also make sure that your team has an up-to-date and internal, uh, internal training on accessibility on an ongoing basis. You know, that means that you're going to be, when people are onboarding, you're going to make sure that that's part of that training and you're going to make sure they're going to make sure that that's a priority for your team. And then, you know, another thing that they could be responsible for are identifying and measuring any accessibility rate related KPIs that make sense for your team or for your organization. Those are really going to help you figure out how to track if the changes you're making are making a difference, if everything is working and how things are going. And then finally, you know, really importantly, having someone like this, they can help your team or your organization create actual realistic and attainable milestones or goals for your organization to work towards. Jasmine, next slide, please. So, you know, for sure to inform all of these decisions that you're going to be making, make sure that you have and you set up a feedback loop that encourages users to understand your accessibility goals and provide you with meaningful feedback. You know, to do that, we always recommend folks, have an accessibility statement on your website, like just the same as you would have a privacy policy, you know, something that's going to be easy to read and that's going to be easy to find for users. You know, in that accessibility statement, you know, be open about where you are with accessibility and, you know, what you're working towards, like what your goals are. Any metrics or data that you can provide to show your progress and what you're doing are great as well on that statement. And then again, like I said at the top, Make sure you have an easily apparent and easy to use feedback mechanism in place. You know, you need some place that users can share what is and isn't working and any errors that they're finding, you know, so that way, and then, you know, when you do get accessibility feedback from your users, you know, make it a priority to respond to that quickly and thoughtfully. And then having this in place is really gonna make that possible for your team. Okay. Um, and with that, I'm going to give it over to Jasmine to, to talk a little bit of some of our resources. Awesome. Thank you so much, both. I think it's been um, very, very interesting and very insightful. Um, I even recognize some of those things myself, like Lars, you mentioned the redundancy, having that convenience myself as an online shopper. I love just being able to check that um, checkbox for my billing address and not having to fill it out again. Um, I'm also very happy to hear about the um, minimum pixel size as well on things like for, for tablets and um, phones, for example. My own grandfather has a neurological condition, which makes it difficult for him with navigation. And I know one of the most frustrating things for him is when he's trying to watch something on Netflix, but accidentally clicks on the wrong show because the buttons are so small. So it's great to see improvements being made on that front. Um, before we jump into the Q&A, and I'm glad we have so much time for it because we've been getting lots of great questions and I know we have your pre-submitted questions as well. Uh, I did just want to highlight some of the resources that we do have available here from Moncito. So uh, we do have the accessibility handbook available. Uh, we also have a couple of different checklists depending on whether you are a content creator, a manager, or a designer developer. So if it's something you're just getting started with, they're great checklists to kind of give you an overview of how to kick those off. Has um, Sydney also so importantly stated, it's great to have an accessibility statement generator on your, or accessibility statement on your website. The good news is we can help you generate one because we have a generator for that. 
And then we also have a color contrast checker, which is um, very important for the design of your website. As Lars was saying before, it's very frustrating if you have an indicator that's brown on a black background because the color contrast just simply isn't high enough for you to be able to see that. So definitely use that and check that out. Before we do jump into the Q&A, we as always would love to help you out with um, tackling website accessibility. So I'm just gonna launch this poll here um, and you can indicate if you are interested in a free website or complimentary website accessibility scan from us. If you're interested in seeing Moncito's accessibility module, if you just wanna find out if you're compliant with WCAG 2.2, the draft version, we actually have the ability to scan for that. And we'll of course continue to update that as the release gets closer or all of the above. And per popular demand, I've also added in the poll, if you're already a Mencito customer, then you can already do all of these things in your account. Um, and I will just leave that open while we jump into the Q&A actually. So I think we have a couple of pre-submitted questions that I do wanna jump into, but I do also have a really great, great question that came in live that I wanna address first, because I know it's something that Lars and Sydney and I discussed beforehand, whether or not we should include in the presentation. And we actually decided to leave it out to keep everything focused and simple, but um, Lars, this question perhaps you can answer. And it is someone who asked um, WCAG 2.1, had three levels, level A, double A, and triple A, will double UCAG 2.2 also have this? Yeah, thank you, it's a good question. Yeah, it, it will. And um, as Sydney said in, in the beginning, the, the new version is backwards, can, can, um, <laughs> can't say it that way, <laughs> uh, um, compatible. Yeah, okay. exactly, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so, so just to ensure that, uh, at least just for that reason, it still has these uh, three uh, levels, A, double, uh, double A, and triple A. These levels, we didn't get into it. That's right. There are three other levels than, than the ones I, I talked about in the beginning. So, so single A is just like the most basic uh, success criteria. Then we have double A, which is what uh, the legislation points at. And then we have this uh, third, uh, which, which is AAA, where we have some even even more success criteria, and that still exists in the new version. And if you remember, I said at the beginning we have nine new criteria, and I only showed you seven slides for new criteria. And that's, and that's actually because two of them they they live on like the level double A, and then there's a more enhanced version at AAA. Uh, so that that they're just a bit stricter on, on the level AAA. Um, so yeah, that still that still uh, exists in your version. That, that's a, that's your whole answer. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Lars. And I'm also just going to clarify that um, at the beginning, I mentioned ADA and 2.0. Someone very eloquently, and I say thank you for correcting that, the ADA predates 2.1, but more recent guidance from, on ADA.gov, which I believe was shared as well in the chat, actually links to uh, uh, the official W3C who publishes the WCAG, which is not specifying specifically, but again, linking to these standards as um, Sydney also mentioned is very common for a lot of legislation to do. Um, the next question that I have here, um, just from the pre-submitted ones and for anyone who joined a little bit late, will the session be recorded and will slides be shared afterwards? Yes, please just give us a couple of days to process um, the recording and it should be in your inbox at the start of next week. Um, one of the next uh, pre-submitted questions we have is, um, how do you, and Lars, perhaps you can answer this one, how do you make mapping applications more accessible? Yeah, I can say something about that. So there's a good question because maps are really, they can be a, 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 a difficult challenge, but, but what you should really think about is probably more, how can you make a good alternative to the map? Because the map itself is, even though it may technically be possible, it's really, really hard to, to make a, a, a map uh, accessible for, for all groups of people. So what I would usually suggest is that, that you think about how can you also 
besides your map have some kind of accessible alternative. So, so what you really need to think about is what what's the um, what's the core functionality of your map, or why would your user uh, want to look at your map? Because usually there's there's a lot of information going on. If you look at at any map, you can see a lot of details there, but but all these details are not necessarily what your user needs to know in that context. So to give an example, for example, let, let's say you have a map showing which schools are in your school district. You, you want to find uh, a school close to your uh, home address, for example, in your school district. And if that's the purpose of your map, uh, I mean, it, it, it could be a map, so it would show where are you right now with the red dot, and then it will show which schools are uh, near you. So, so in that case, it would, the purpose would really be to how, how do I figure out what are the closest school here? So an, an alternative to that would be just to, to, for example, make a text field where you could enter your address, do a search, and then it comes up with a list, a uh, text links, uh, list where, for example, a screen reader user could also read just the text version of, of that information. So think about what's, what's the purpose of the map in this context, and then think of how can you show that in some kind of text alternative also. Awesome, thank you so much, Lars. Always great to uh, yeah, give text alternatives to visuals. And our next question actually relates to that. So a person has a question about best practices for images on a website. And the person said, it seems the images are mostly used for decorative pur purposes um, are they still necessary to keep a user engaged on a page? Um, what do you think about decorative images with regards to accessibility? Yeah. Lars, Could I take, take that one as well? Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's really good point here because I completely agree uh, on many, many websites, uh, a lot of the, the graphics and the images going on, they, they are really what I would call decorative images. So they they are there to, to make the page look good, but they don't really carry any information. So that's that's what we call decorative images. And imagine someone like me who can't see what's on the screen. I'm reading it with my screen reader. And if you put a lot of information for the screen reader in all these decorative images, it just means that it takes a lot of time for me to reach over the page. Um, so, and it's, all, it's, it's actually also in, in the very first success criteria in, in, in WCAG, that's about that, that uh, specifically, specifically uh, addresses uh, the images. And, and it also says that if it's a, I mean, if it's a decorative image, the, the screen reader should be able just to skip the image. So, and, and the way we do that is really by applying, that now gets a little bit technical, but for, for those of you who are into HTML, it's, it's just by applying the empty attribute in, in your image tag. So by doing that, uh, the screen reader will just completely ignore the image and not reading uh, reading it. So so I, as a blind person, would not have to spend time listening to uh, here's a flower or whatever kind of uh, text alternative people could, could put on it. Awesome, yeah. thanks. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. It's so important important to make sure that decorative images are not being read up by your screen reader so that you can get to the content more quickly. The next question that I also have from the pre-submitted ones are is about, from a learning development perspective, what are some tips to balance the potential gap between uh, learning about these guidelines and quick learning development? And I was reading this question before the webinar and I made a joke with Lars and Sydney, and I said, well, of course, the best way to learn about it is join our webinars, but Lars actually has some better tips about how to tackle that, so I'll let him share that. Yeah, thank you. I guess there are many ways you can, you can tackle it, but, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> but at least um, I suggest you consider your own role in this because many of the things they are relevant for developers. There's some many things are for developers to fix or to solve. Uh, many things are for, or some things are for designers, like the, the graphical designers, and some things are for uh, the content editors. And I think ra rather than drowning yourself by trying to to learn the entire week standard, which is a huge, huge thing just to, 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 to get through, I think 
um, try and find some checklists which focuses on your specific role because it, if you're a content editor, for example, there's no need that you kill yourself with all these very, very technical programming details that would only be relevant for, for developers, for example. So, so a good checklist um, fitting uh, your role could, could be one, one, one way to tackle this. Absolutely. And I think if you're already a Monsito user, we actually do have the ability for you to filter accessibility issues based off of your role. So that also means you can more quickly um, tackle those different uh, issues. And the next question I have also from the pre-submitted, and then we'll start jumping more into the live ones. Uh, Sydney, perhaps you can answer. And uh, the person here, as I actually also thought, said that currently the DOJ recognizes WCAG 2.0, though someone may perhaps have updated us on that, but any ideas on when WCAG 2.2 will be the standard used by the DOJ? Yeah, thanks, Jasmine. Um, you know, no one really knows when that's going to get updated or how that's going to get updated. Um, but, you know, as we always say, complying with 2.2 means that you're going to comply with any of the versions that have come out so far. So, you know, our really, just to hammer at home, our, our recommendation is that you go with trying to comply with the most recent standard because, you know, no one really does know when that is going to come down, but they are linking again, as Jasmine mentioned, directly to the W3C that writes the WCAG guidelines. Um, and their most recent version is 2.2. So we expect that to happen at some point. Exactly. And I think related to that, we also had a question about how will WCAG 2.2 be rolled out across different states and or even countries. And I think, Sydney, your answer there is probably applicable to that as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say so. You know, obviously, no one really knows what different states or countries are going to choose to do in the future. Um, but that's something to keep an eye on, I think, on your individual states, probably on your individual states website. Awesome. Thanks. So we got a lot of great um, questions coming in live here as well. So I'm going to start jumping into them. And the first one is um, Lars for you, probably. How do text based CAPTCHAs for form interactions with the new accessible authentication criteria work? For example, is asking a question like, if tomorrow is Tuesday, what day is today? Is that a better option? I would say that that would uh, probably also count as, as a cognitive test. So, so you would not really be allowed to do that. Well, one of the details is you you can actually you can still do that this, but but then you need to um, provide some kind of alternative. So if you're doing, if you're asking people for these cognitive tests, uh, you 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 can still do this if you offer an alternative. So for example, let's say uh, this capture that could be for when you are creating your account somewhere the first time you're signing up for a new account somewhere, this, this could be it. Um, so you could have what is described here, but then, and that and, and that that would not work. <laughs> but, but then to make it work, you could give the user an alternative, like, for example, the ability to sign up by email. You know, sometimes you can enter your email address and then um, get an, basically get a link through an email where the user can kind of uh, authenticate himself or herself through that link in the email. So so then in that case, the email would not uh, would not be considered a cognitive test here. So we would need, need something like that. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Lars. It's a it's a really good point. I know CAPTCHA is something that a lot of people have struggled with for a, a long time. And then there was the emergence of these types of um, questions or simple math problems. But that was a challenge from a cognitive perspective. So as you guys can see, there's always an evolution in accessibility as well. Uh, the next question that we have is someone asking how many people are not able to use a mouse for navigation? I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure Sydney or Lars know the specific statistics for the US of how many people, for example, use non-mouse navigation. Um, but there, there's definitely a significant um, part of the population that, that does, right? And even if you're on your phone or your tablet, think of about how many of us browse um, websites through uh, not using a keyboard, but through a mouse or, ta or a tablet or 
phone or tablet, um, there is a, definitely a big port, but I do think we have a blog post that does have some statistics on that. So I'd be happy to add that to the follow-up as well. Or if anyone knows, feel free to share it in the chat. I think the next question we have is, again, probably Lars, a slightly technical question for you. Uh, are there, oh no, actually, this is a question about upcoming webinar topics. Are there any upcoming webinars to discuss success criteria for browser zoom, text resize, or reflow issues? We do not have anything planned as of right now, but thank you so much for your ideas. We will definitely look into it because those are very important topics. So it's definitely something that I know Lars is very passionate about us sharing. So we'll, we'll look into it. Uh, the next question is also related to CAPTCHA. Um, is there a recommendation to replace verification tools like CAPTCHA where websites are concerned with bots, crawlers, and spam? Lars, do you have an, any input to that? Yeah, you can, you can hear me again now, is that correct? Yeah, okay. Um, I would say, I mean, these these captures, um, they are they are just they're difficult to use for, <laughs> for many different reasons. But particularly for people using assistive technologies, and like for I can say for myself, for example, as a blind, blind person, obviously I can't use these visual captures where, where you have to recognize something at an, an image. Then in some cases, there's uh, the opportunity to get an audio capture, which is you you it plays some distorted sounds and you have to kind of decipher some words or letters or something from that. And even that can be very difficult to understand. Um, so I, I would just uh, recommend really to find uh, other ways of, uh, of authenticating people like, uh, for example, as I mentioned, having people to prove themselves through an email or something. Uh, a phone call or something similar to that. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Lars. Um, the next question that I have is how is, and Sydney, you can probably elaborate a little bit on this one. How is Mancito different from the WAVE tool? Uh, and is Mancito a service or do we actually provide a tool? Yeah, thanks, Jasmine. So I'm not personally. Uh, familiar with WAVE specifically, but, you know, Moncito offers both, you know, obviously it's kind of a comprehensive platform that allows you to check for accessibility errors. So it's going to crawl your website and it's going to check for things automatically. It's also going to provide you with the areas you need to check for to do manual accessibility testing. You know, no tool on the market this, you know, that exists right now can check for every WCAG you know, success criteria. There's just, it would take a lot of machine learning. It's just, it's really not a thing. So you're going to have to do some manual testing. So, you know, Moncito will both do what it can automatically, and it will also help you organize and prioritize those manual checks. Um, we also offer support that, you know, would not be available in something like WAVE to help people understand accessibility better and to use our platform. So I would say that it's a much more comprehensive uh, tool and option it's kind of the it's what would be available in that plus a lot more awesome things and as a marketer and communicator who uses our tool ourselves there's two other things i want to add on that i really love about it um so i also get um weekly reports sent to me about because we have different team members adding content i'm sure a lot of you guys recognize that as well and not everyone is as up to date or familiar with accessibility so i get a report that lets me know if someone's uploaded some an image, for example, and they forgot to put the alt text on it. So that's really nice. And then the other really nice thing is because I get those reports on a weekly basis, I can also see our history over time and make sure that we, for example, never get beneath a certain accessibility uh, percentage because I want to make sure that as much of our content is always accessible to everyone. So that's um, a little insight into what we do. Um, one of the other questions um, that we have is, it's a similar question, are there any self-serve tools for website checking? I know uh, that 
we also talk a lot about accessibility as a service, but we have our tool is about you helping uh, to check yourself and make those updates yourself. We just kind of identify where those issues and areas are. Uh, the next question that I have in here is about live chat. Um, and Lars, perhaps you can elaborate a little bit on this from your own experience. Are live chat pop-ups or overlays, are those typically accessible? Yeah, I can say something about that. It's uh, in many cases uh, the answer is no, and it doesn't mean that you can't make them accessible. Uh, but in my experience, many of these um, these these chat functionalities that's that's typically some third party things people install on their websites, and and in, at least in my experience, many companies who who provide these uh, chat functionalities they are not. Um, that much intro accessibility yet so at least for now many of them are not that accessible i would say and, and that could the consequence could be something like let's say for example i'm trying to use the chat function on the screen reader i'm uh, typing in a question and then i then i don't get notified when at some point an answer pops up for example so i don't really know in the screen reader because i can't see visually when when the answer shows up and, and, and that's then then there's nothing really notifying me about it or it could just be like the navigation buttons in there uh, often i see like unlabeled buttons so rather than my screen you could just say send message button it just says button so i don't know uh, what what actually happens so so i don't feel in many cases i don't feel very comfortable uh, using these functionalities because i'm not certain about what, what's actually going on? Um, I think it's it's getting slightly better. They're getting a bit more accessible over time, but for now, most are actually not not that accessible. Yes, thanks, Lars, for sharing that with us. Um, and I think that's a really good reminder for all of us that anytime you're installing something that's a third party. Um, application on your website or integrating it via an iframe or any type of thing. Remember, it is you as the website owner who is responsible for the accessibility. So that's why it's very important that you also think about uh, the accessibility of any third party services that you procure um, to be added to your website. And in addition, we have a, a great question actually from a Moncito customer. Um, and they're wondering if uh, what Moncito scans the base the site based off of? Is it WCG 2.0, 2.1, or 2.2? And I think that's a fantastic question. I think one of our customer success team members can maybe drop it the the link to our our help center article around this because you can actually choose in the Moncito platform um, which level you want to scan. So you can choose WCAG 2.2. You can choose WCAG 2.1 and have your website scanned according to that. Or as Sydney mentioned earlier, we've also released um, the ability to scan uh, against WCAG 2.2, the draft version, because as we all know, the official version is coming out in early 2023, which is why we hosted this webinar to help prepare everyone. So if that is something you are working towards, you can go in and change those settings in your account and scan your website against the 2.2 draft version and make sure you're already working towards that compliance ahead of it being released. And with that, I think we've run out of time, um, but I know there's plenty more questions. I promise um, Sydney and Lars are going to get a document from me tomorrow with all of the questions so I can help get answers for all of you. And we will either follow up with you personally or make sure that there is a Q&A document and the follow-up. On the slide here, I also have our contact details if there's anything you'd like to follow up with us. Or, you know what, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. I encourage everyone, I know Lars is great at sharing tips and tricks around accessibility. Uh, I'm sure Sydney's great about sharing tips and tricks about our tool. If you requested a website accessibility scan or consultation for us uh, from us, uh, please do stay tuned and I will make sure that our team will follow up with you shortly. And with that, we just wanna say a really big thank you and thank you Lars and Sydney for enlightening us on the upcoming 2.2 version.